Yeah, Cambodia Revisited. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and I'm broadcasting from New York City. Uh, and we are talking to Adetep Mies. He's with Project Expedite Justice uh, in Cambodia, Phnom Penh. What a what a day! My gosh, we're strapping the world here between New York and and Phnom Penh here on Think Tech. Fabulous. Welcome to the show, Adetep. Thank you for having me. So tell us about um, you know your background because you're not you know you're not the average Cambodian but you are Cambodian. Uh, tell us uh, how Cambodian are you uh, and what you're doing in Phnom Penh these days. <laughs> um, so I for the majority of my life I was uh, I was raised here. I went to school here, graduated uh, with a diploma here. I um, went to law school here. Um, so I'm like ninety five percent Cambodian. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of my background, I'm currently a legal consultant for Project Expedite Justice and also a case manager. Um, outside of PEJ, I uh, work as a moot court coach for my uh, law university. Which is? Um, Royal University of Law and Economics. And um, I essentially coach a team of five students uh, and prepare them for an international moot court competition that usually takes place in DC. Oh, fabulous. So where'd you get your English, in Brooklyn? Um, <clears throat> I grew up um, watching and consuming a lot of American media. So <laughs> that is probably where I got the accent from. Yeah, well, you know, your, your uh, English could pass for American English anytime. I must say that's, that's terrific. And that that's a benefit, isn't it? I mean, being a lawyer is a benefit and speaking English the way you do, that's got to be a benefit, isn't it? Slight correction. I'm not yet a lawyer, although I intend to try for the bar here. And perhaps after, if I finish a master's in the U.S., I could also try for the bar there. Hmm. Okay, well... Stop by Hawaii. You know, we have a master's program at the University of Hawaii, uh, William S. Richardson School of Law, and we have a close connection with them. So mm -hmm. stop by Hawaii. That'll be great. Okay, so we're going to talk about, I, I want you to, uh, <laughs> maybe you can just show while you're here. That would be really interesting. So uh, I would like to talk about Cambodia for a minute, and I'm I'm interested in Cambodia, maybe more than I was ever, because uh, three weeks ago in Honolulu, um, they were doing a uh, a stage play called uh, the Cambodian <laughs> Cambodian Rock Band, uh, which is really interesting. <laughs> so, what is this about? Well, it was about Killing Fields, and it was about a rock band, um, and they played a lot of rock music in this play um, in Cambodia. And through this through this uh, look at it, this approach to it, you learned a lot about what happened in Cambodia. But can you talk about that for a minute? What did happen in Cambodia? And what kind of effect did it leave on Cambodia? And how do you feel that effect now? Um, so uh, I would describe every Cambodians as being very resilient. Uh, because if you look into our history, we've had a lot of wars, um, wars with our neighboring countries, um, and also internal wars where uh, we just fight each other prominently in 1975. That's when um, the bad stuff started to happen. <laughs> the Khmer Rouge uh, overtook the city, and then it led to millions and millions of executions, senseless killings, actually, and genocide you know, of people in Cambodia. I read that a lot of that Khmer Rouge was, in fact, funded by China. I find, and, 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 and there's been some reporting, too, that the U.S., in part, also funded Khmer Rouge, and I'm not sure why. Um, but do you, do you know about that? Is, is that something that's generally known in Cambodia, that China was funding that government and its government, you know, a special kind of government that kills its own citizens, um, and that the U.S. also had a part in supporting Khmer Rouge? Mm. So um, I'll, I'll talk as... A late person, like when I was um, as a freshman, a, a first year law student, I didn't know that at all. I know that the killing fields, uh, the genocide, the Khmer Rouge took place, but not um, who backed or who contributed to the war, right? So China did send arms to, I think, uh, part of the faction here that was fighting, and also um, there was uh, this 
prominent military general from the US, Henry Kissinger. He sort of ordered the bombing of Cambodia, which um, the effect of that bombing is quite debatable as to whether it was the catalyst for the Khmer Rouge to overtake because it did uh, do some damage to one of the rivaling parties here. But um, mm -hmm. the, interesting the how you know you sometimes you don't know the consequences of your act. Every act right. has a reaction, especially geopolitical and military. And in this case, that was probably a, a surprise to Henry Kissinger, who, um, you know, a lot of people like him, but a lot of people don't. Uh, right. So uh, this doesn't endear me to him, actually. Yeah, sometimes um, in the pursuit of fighting evil, uh, you are yourself committing acts that are more evil than the evil that you're trying to combat. Yeah, yeah. So but you still it's good have to commissions oh, going on. You still have commissions going on about the killing fields. Is that over yet? And that was, uh, I guess, encouraged by European interests and probably American interests to have a commission and have some, what do you want to call it, uh, justice um, in Cambodia about the, the genocide. What's the state mm. of affairs with that now? Um, so the court is currently ending. Uh, we have a uh, sort of um, a Cambodian version of the International Criminal Tribunal of the Forum of Yugoslavia and Rwanda, the ICTY and ICTR. Here we call it the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia, otherwise known as the ECCC, and uh, it aims to prosecute senior uh, leaders of Khmer Rouge. Um, as of current, it is set to end or be terminated uh, by the end of this year with one active case that is ongoing. Hmm. Is that is that fellow a um, a, 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 a criminal type who committed a lot of atrocities? Yeah, he was one of the senior leaders of uh, Khmer Rouge. And this is all in the Cambodian rock band play. I tell you, it's very educational and it, it it actually makes me want to know more about Cambodia. So when I saw this article today in the Washington Post, I haven't seen it yet in the New York Times, but in the Washington Post reporting that Cambodia was uh, uh, doing a groundbreaking uh, to start the construction for a Chinese naval base, in, I guess in the Gulf of Thailand. Um, this is very, very interesting. I know we're not here to talk about geopolitics, um, but I wonder if you could speak just a little on, on Cambodia's relationship with China, um, friendly or not, and its relationship with Russia, friendly or not, and its relationship with the United States. So admittedly, um, I have very limited knowledge in the construction of the naval base, but to give insight to the relationship between Cambodia and uh, China, uh, in past experience, um, we, we were handling a case of human trafficking, which the perpetrators were Taiwanese nationals, and um, the victims were Cambodian nationals. Uh, all of them were male. Uh, all of them came from diverse backgrounds. But one, the one thing that they share in common is that they want to turn their lives around. These are very, these people are come from very poor background that they have to sacrifice. Um, that they have to liquidate most of their assets to get money so that they can pay a recruitment agency to teach them the vocational skills and be sent to another country in hopes of finding a better economic opportunity, right? Um, then turns out they were defrauded. They were smuggled into another, no, sorry, smuggle is a, is a wrong term to use. Um, they were sent there legally, but um, upon reaching um, the country, they had their passports withheld, and they were forced to beg in a country where they're not familiar with, mm -hmm. in a language that they do not know. Oh, so, terrible. right, when they come back, you know, they, and this was what uh, got me into Project Expedite Justice in the first place, because my supervisor um, at the time, Kristen Rosella, she invited me, or she tagged me along to a witness or a victim sort of interview, and we sort of took statements, and that's sort of enrages me when I hear uh, the accounts of the victims. These people are already poor. These people want to work to turn their lives around and they were exploited. Um, so 
how is this relevant to the relationship between China and Cambodia? The perpetrators were Taiwanese, and before our authorities could act, they fled to Taiwan. Um, we sort of ask our local authorities to try to cooperate with Taiwanese authorities to get these perpetrators, perhaps extradite them to uh, prosecute them here in Cambodia because the crime happened here. Uh, our authorities just refused because in doing so, they, they have not explicitly stated their reasoning, but um, they just refused without a reason. And uh, this is sort of speculation, but I think um, in doing so, would, we would be impliedly recognizing Taiwan as their own sovereign nation. Oh, how interesting the way that creeps into everything in Asia, uh, right. Taiwan and China. <laughs> That's so interesting. Yeah. Right. And doing so, we would be angering China and that, you know, China being our biggest investor, we wouldn't want to do that. Oh, my goodness, that's, that, is, that is so offensive, actually. I'm sorry. Mm. <laughs> China is everywhere pulling the Taiwan game. Um, so anyway, so let's talk about uh, what you're doing for, well, let's talk about the state of corruption, if you will, in Cambodia. I mean, Cambodia is attractive in some sense. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you're having a nice enough life there, uh, maybe a better life than you would have had in other parts of, uh, of Southeast Asia. Um, um, and you, you know, been able to go to school, and I'm sure you'll do well in your career, which I guess is you're planning to do your career in Cambodia and Phnom Penh, I guess. But um, you know, query what what kind of a place is it in terms of uh, the corruption, in terms of your ability to express yourself, um, freedom of expression, uh, in terms of your work for Project Expedite Justice. Mm, I'm very thankful for the life that I have and have been given so far. Um, I've been introduced to many opportunities, law school, and especially the introduction to moot court, it was one of them, where uh, I got to experience what it's like to be in DC. We went to DC for about three weeks, one week for the competition, the remaining two to just sightsee. And um, the type of expression that are allowed in between the two countries are vastly different. So we do have our own laws concerning free speech here, but it's not as broad or as free as the First Amendment in America. And um, it gave me perspective when one of the Jessup moot court competition, the problem uh, was about the freedom of speech. And there was this activist who was just going crazy on Twitter. And then he had his uh, account suspended or banned, right? Um, and then I tried to take um, various incidents uh, from other countries, from the US, from India, from China, where similar things have happened. And uh, my group of students were very happy. They were very knowledgeable in discussing these cases until I bring up cases relating to Cambodia. Then they started to whisper and then they started to not respond at all. And it was just me explaining what is happening. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that is anecdotal, but pe people are scared to express their political opinions because um, defamation is one thing and can be liable to um, sanctions, but lies uh, can also be sanctions, which I think is contrary to what uh, international law provides us in terms of political rights. Very interesting that um, you talk about that. I, have you have you followed the Shapiro case, which is which is going on now in Washington? I think it's uh, the Shapiro uh, case. Yeah, uh, he's a he was a law professor uh, who was hired by I think it was uh, the GW Law School, and uh, before he got there, he made some statements about the the First Amendment and about how um, you 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 should and could be able to. Um, you know, discuss, and I forget exactly what he said in an article, um, discuss um, mm, Trumpist anti-democratic values in an article. Um, and, th and that would be more important. Um, uh, and the First Amendment would permit that, even though they were, uh, these, these values were really um, not acceptable to a lot of people at the university and at the law school. And there was a, a big stink raised about it. 
Um, so much so that um, he had to go in front of some committee in the, in the law school. Uh, and they ultimately found that, yes, uh, the First Amendment trumped his, um, his comments. And although the students didn't like it much, uh, they were going to let him do it. But he was under so much pressure that he ultimately resigned his job at the law school. Now, what I'm telling you all of this, and you can you can read up on the Shapiro thing, um, but what I'm telling you is that I think the First Amendment is in a different place now, because uh, you can make statements that you know nobody would have wondered about before um, that they were protected by the First Amendment. But there are some people who spew poison, who spew hatred, who spew things that are. Um, inconsistent with our democratic values, and maybe just maybe that's so dangerous that that the First Amendment um, will not protect you, and that was the issue with this guy Shapiro. Have you had any knowledge about that? Do you agree with what I'm saying? Was this covered in your moot court, your Jessup moot court? Um. So it. So my moot court problem was was. Uh... Uh, predicated upon election fraud. So one of the perk of the uh, competition is that it takes up very cutting edge issues, meaning um, what issues are relevant at our current time. So the students can feel like they are actual lawyers going before the International Court of Justice debating the current issue. Um, in uh, So last year's problem was based off of Trump's suspension off of Twitter for his uh, posting of tweets um, that were, I think, by Twitter related to the Jan 6 riot. Um, so he was suspended for that. So it was something similar where this- Yeah, person... something very similar. It's interesting how you, were, you, you certainly covered that issue, or at least you had it on the table anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Jessup competition does um, provide an opportunity for us to discuss um, uh, current relevant cases. And even back in 2018, um, it, the, the whole theme was about nuclear weapons. And that was the whole debacle between North Korea threatening to, I think, strike Guam, a U.S. military base. And then mm -hmm. Trump infamously went before the United Nations General Assembly to give that very infamous speech of little rocket man is on a suicide mission. I remember um, that death to diplomacy i suppose um but uh it's 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 um it's very so going back to the discussion of free speech you have to look into what is socially acceptable but that is a very hard assessment to make right because you're always going to have uh groups that think differently. You're going to have two or three or four groups that might think that certain things are um, <clears throat> acceptable and others are not. Like for instance, the discussion of abortion, you have the people who are um, extremely pro-life and those who are extremely pro-choice. And then there's the middle ground people, the people sitting on the fences that think that abortion should be um, legalized, but only in certain conditions like under rape, incest, or it is to protect the mother's life. So you certainly um, sound like an American lawyer, out of that. Uh, Do you think about <laughs> you think about coming and practicing in the United States? Do you think about becoming an international lawyer and practicing in many places? I try to be as reasonable as possible uh, and not look <laughs> extreme. Okay. <laughs> because well, let's talk about what... your work for Project Expedite Justice. What are you mm -hmm. doing for them? Um, so uh, I am a consultant and a case manager. I am uh, sort of the person that uh, makes sure that every case is, uh, are managed properly. And by managed, I mean uh, they are processed, they're stored properly so that when uh, our members, our team needed, uh, they know where to go. Um, that might seem like an irrelevant job, but when you factor in, uh, when you are working in multiple countries, conducting multiple investigations, and um, cases will start to pile up, right? So you'll face hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of documents, uh, thousands even, 
and um, it's it's going to get very hectic to find certain tidbits of information that you really need from tens and thousands of uh, documents. But I'm lucky that you know I've been given this opportunity because also part of that is to analyze evidence, and um, I've worked along my supervisors to um, essentially process evidence so that they can be uh, prepared into a memorial and be sent before uh, the ICC. Or mm -hmm. if we are not pursuing um, judicial accountability, we can do it in the form of advocacy uh, and the judicial accountability can be done later. And under advocacy, we uh, try to let the world know these are the things that are happening in these countries, namely um, Sudan, South Sudan, and other parts of Africa, where uh, there's just, to, to an outsider, it is very confusing and strange, and you can't really determine as to why this is still happening. There's mass ethnic violence happening in these countries. It, it is treading on the line of genocide where different tribes from different uh, regions are fighting each other. Um, some are trying to claim territory. Some are just trying to claim dominance. It's what you see with uh, what happened in Rwanda with the, uh, I forgot the faction's names. <laughs> I apologize. It's okay. We're, we're, we're flying around the world here. It's okay. <laughs> you know, I, you know, there was something also in the paper today about uh, talk about genocide and, and um, attacking people in another ethnic or religious, uh, you know, uh, culture, organization, mm. race, what have you. And there was something in the paper today about an attack. Uh, I guess it was a shooting attack in Africa, um, where the, the, um, the, these, these people attacked the Catholics in the church and killed a lot of people, um, Catholics praying in a church. And that's, that's new. Um, you know, we know there's been a lot of genocide and senseless killing uh, in Rwanda, uh, in um, Sudan, other places in Africa, Central Africa, but, um, but this is new, religious. And so I, I ask you this question, is it getting worse? It appears to be. Um... But um, it, it really depends on the country. Some countries are doing far better than others and far better than they were um, in the past few years. Like South Sudan, there has been um, less uh, violence because of uh, this discussion around a peace agreement, although violence is, it, it is not non-existent, but um, it is definitely at a lower rate than what we've seen during the birth of that country back in 2011 or 2012. Yeah. Um, uh, and in America, I, you know, my heart goes to all the families uh, who are victimized by all the shootings that are happening across the country. There was one in Oklahoma, there was one in, I think, in Tulsa, and there was another, I think it was uh, five hours ago, there was another mass shooting at a church. So um, it's, it depends well, what do you on make the of that. I mean, you're, um, you're a student lawyer. Law student, and uh, you familiar with um, American court process and appellate court process in the Jessup uh, Moot Court, um, and um, you have the vantage of being in a country which has seen atrocities and and thinks about atrocities, and you can see from Project Expedite Justice um, what you know what's going on in Africa. I suppose you you know what's going on in Latin America and the world, uh, and you uh, and you have told me as many have that the these atrocities, these war crimes, the need for this investigation, the need for this database of documents is growing. Uh, if not for prosecution, then at least to make a memorial record of who's been doing what. Really important what you're doing. Um, but the question is, how, how do you see the U.S. these days? I, did you follow the January 6th insurrection? Um, are you following what is happening to our democracy? Um, our rule of law, our Supreme Court. What are your thoughts about that? I, I know you're not American, but you, you're very close to, to being American. So I wonder what your thoughts are. Thank you. Um, 
I, you, I, you can't really pinpoint as to why these um, events occur. Uh, all you know is that it's horrible and these people should get the maximum sentence, you know, with due respect to their fair trial rights, of course. Um, but I think part of why these shootings keep occurring is I think the glorification of murderers. Um, people keep looking back into um, uh, the Columbine shooting, I think. And um, they keep making these stories. It's always talked about. And especially in the digital age, I think everybody wants to become famous. Everybody wants their 15 minutes of fame. Um, you know, some would go on to a social media app, make themselves go viral so that they can do something with that um, fame, 15 minutes of fame, while others take it, take a different approach and then try to, I, I don't know, uh, they just commit <laughs> the most evil. Um, my only take of that is to, I'm not sure why as to America does not uh, employ uh, or mandate that all schools have security uh, screenings. You can just put, um, I think, like one of those metal detectors at the entrance or at the exit of the school and make sure that there's limited entrances so that these things don't happen, right? Maybe take some away from the TSA and put them in schools instead. <laughs> <laughs> you, the the security at the TSA is crazy. You have to take off your jacket, any metal on you. You have to take off your shoes. <laughs> Don't I know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but with all good reason, of course. All the that TV. considered, right? And you work for PEJ. Um, your your uh, experience that we've discussed. Um, what's the solution to this? Uh, not not necessarily limited to the U.S., although the, the U.S. is certainly a special case. And I I totally agree with you about this, uh, you know, public spectacular kind of legacy that some of these young people want to have, even though they're they're likely to die in the process. Uh, but what what's the solution to it? What's the solution to it in in um, you know uh, all the places you've investigated? Uh, and in the U.S., uh, there must be something we, as a species, can do to cut this out. I mean, for example, people suggested never mention the name of the perpetrator. Don't give him the legacy. Um, but that, that seems like a small step. What are your thoughts in general? So before getting to uh, America, I'll just speak for other parts of the country in relation to uh, my work at PEJ. Um, as part of case management, I think it is important to document these atrocities. Um, there was a popular saying about case management, if you don't document it, uh, technically it never happened, right? Mm -hmm. And the purpose of documentation is to make sure uh, to raise awareness so that history never repeats itself. It is very important for other countries besides America because in America, almost every case is, is um, publicized and there is a nationwide debate of everything. But in other countries like Sudan or even here in Cambodia, there's less transparency with our judiciary. Um, law students are not engaged with the law. They only read what the law says and tries to interpret it by text, but they don't really know how to apply that law. And the only way to know is to become a lawyer and be involved in the case of that specific law. Right? So we have no database, we have no um, uh, release of judicial decisions, which is contrary to what the ECCC does, because it's a hybrid court, it releases its, all of its judicial decisions, it gives outsiders um, an opportunity to learn why the court come to a certain reasoning and you know, the opinions of judges, right? These people who we... Um, uh, who we uh, say that deserves to uh, apply the law in the best interests of the public. But because there's no transparency, law students are not engaged. Um, and so these, the, the, the continuous occurrence of corruption will be ongoing. Because when there is an instance of corruption, when it does uh, make public news, it is not as 
uh, public, I guess, uh, you have to really look for it. So that is also another issue with access to information where cases are not blown up. And because of that, everything sort of, uh, the ripple effect is not that much, right? So then when violations do occur, sometimes they go under the radar, which would lead to more impunity. Yeah, really important thoughts. Uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you about, again, from your vantage, from you know seeing this on, a, on the basis of your experience and your view of the world, what about Ukraine? Uh, we know there have been war crimes there, and they have been documented in so many ways, although I'm not sure about the, the way that all that documentation has been managed, included in databases and presented so far. Um, but what are your thoughts about the atrocities uh, that have happened in Ukraine? What do you think about the liberal world order, which is at risk in Ukraine? Um. Again, it, I think it's all about geopolitics and um, when you put, uh, for lack of a better term, psychopaths in positions of power, um, they tend to go crazy and they think they are owed everything, right? So, um, and this is not just limited to Russia. China is doing the same with Southeast uh, Asian countries. Uh, the U.S. Is, has been doing it for, or China, sorry, Russia and the U.S. has been doing it for a very long time, ever since World War II. There's, they are not directly fighting, but it's a series of proxy wars um, where I would coin it like small, hot wars, I suppose. Um, with respect to Ukraine, uh, I think there are a lot of uh, public engagement and a lot of documentation on social media. You see it every day. Um, it's continuous. And I think everyone is doing a great job in terms of showing the world what is happening. Um, again, I think that is when diplomacy goes to die. Um, the, uh, I think states should just try to negotiate. And I believe that there were no compromises, which uh, led to the war. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot give like a more detailed. Uh, well, no, I just wanted to get your your you know your view your your uh, you know gut reaction to it on the basis of where you are and what you're doing and and your reach not only uh, in Phnom Penh and Cambodia but uh, in other places in the world through your work with PEJ. But our conversation is not over, Anatep. I, I really want to revisit all these things with you. And I hope you do come to Hawaii, but be, before you come, it's okay. We'll get together just, just this way. <laughs> and we'll have another freewheeling discussion and, and find out what's happening in Phnom Penh, in Cambodia, in Southeast Asia, with Russia and China and the U.S. So many important things to talk about, and they are changing as we speak. <laughs> so I really appreciate your work and your uh, association with BEJ, and uh, thank you very much for coming to our show and talking about these things with me. Thank you uh, for having me, and uh, I would like to say my thanks to PEJ and all my previous supervisors that got me into uh, the field of human rights. Um, I think almost everybody that I know, including my students, they sort of sense that I hate uh, work at private law firms and dealing with private sectors. Um, and such. I think there's already enough resources for that. So uh, e yeah, I, I would like to you know, offer my thanks to uh, my organization for giving me this opportunity for supporting me. I have great supervisors and great colleagues. Um, and thank you for having me on the program. And uh, yeah. Yeah, I would love to appear again. Well, I, I, I want to follow your career. I want to see I want to see you and people like you, uh, lawyers and incipient lawyers like you, um, you know, help us help us deal with a very complex world. Thank you so much, Anatev. Anatev Mies, uh, joining us from Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Aloha.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.